All right, so uh, welcome everybody. Good crowd today, uh, both uh, online and in person. And so today we have a special guest. Normally we've been hosting people from around campus, but today we have John Stone from the University of Illinois over at Urbana-Champaign. And he and I have been collaborating on some, uh, adding virtual reality to molecular visualizations uh, for quite a while. And John is kind of the expert on rendering for molecular uh, visualization. And uh, so I'm going to oh, uh, want to advance your slide and we'll, uh, just for, for everybody else's sake. So this is part of an ongoing uh, lecture series. And so today we're, we're about two thirds of the way through. Uh, next week, of course, is spring break here at IU. Uh, the week after that, Oh, I forgot to update this slide. The week after that, we'll have another talk here on Wednesday that is going to be virtual tourism. I should mute this. Uh, virtual tourism. And, uh, and that'll be here in this room on uh, the Wednesday after spring break. This next one that's in red, the VR expedition. The VR expeditions, we've been doing hands-on things right here in this room. Uh, it's actually going to get moved to April 1st, so it won't be March 25th, uh, for the same reason that we won't have a talk that next Wednesday. I'll be at the uh, uh, virtual reality conference hosted by IEEE, uh, and then we'll close out. We'll have another guest, uh, uh, some guests, not some more guests from the University of Illinois talking about archaeology training with virtual reality, and then we'll close out the semester with VR and Unity. And then for those of you uh, who are just coming here for the first time, there's a another set of uh, talks that are happening Thursdays, Thursdays, Thursdays in the library, library. And, and some, some of the middle, middle ones of those also have to do with virtual reality. And tomorrow's talk, which is also at four o'clock in the uh, Scholars Commons room, is by Margaret Delinsky, who's a professor, our professor here on campus. And she's going, or actually some of her students are going to be presenting uh, some of their work on uh, VR, using VR for digital art. And so with that, we'll jump to uh, John here and take it away. All right. So thanks, Bill. Um, uh, unfortunately, I'm getting over a cold, so you'll have to bear with me. It's kind of hard for me to speak today, but I'll do my best, and hopefully you can understand me, and I'll, I have a safety device here if I start having coughing fits. So I developed a tool called uh, Visual Molecular Dynamics, uh, widely known as VMD, and it's used by scientists to perform a wide variety of different uh, molecular modeling and visualization uh, tasks. Everything from constructing molecules that are then simulated to analyzing their physical properties and their dynamics. Um, and then, of course, rendering figures and uh, doing lots of uh, sort of uh, scientific communication tasks that are routine uh, tasks that people do every day. And I'm going to see if I can hide this thing. There we go. That's a little better. And so the goal of a tool like VMD, in particular, when it's linked with its, uh, its uh, sibling program, NAMD, is uh, to provide a scientist with what we think of as sort of a computational microscope. So the value of the computer simulations that we can do on these supercomputers is that we can see uh, spatial length scales and temporal time scales uh, that are inaccessible to conventional experimental imaging techniques, at least today and for the foreseeable future. And so we can see things atomic in atomic detail, detail that explain, explain the, you know, you know, the underlying dynamics of how these uh, complicated biomolecular systems work. And so uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what VMD does uh, on behalf of the scientists and, and what, are, what sort of sort interactions, interactions they have with the program that are important, important to them uh, that make it useful. So when we visualize these biomolecular structures, this is a little virus capsid. It's actually a virus that attacks tomato plants and tobacco plants. And it's one of the first virus structures that was ever uh, determined in atomic detail. You can see even this is the simplest virus there is. It's, it's a virus that's so simple, it can only infect the plant when it already has an infection by another virus. Um, so this is, you know, it's sort of a secondary infection, right? So this is the literally the simplest virus structure you'll, you'll ever see. But even this is incredibly complicated. The outer part is what holds it together and delivers the viral RNA and in, in the inside here. And that's what attacks the cell and replicates and, and uh, does the damage that we associate with viruses. And so you can see this is incredibly complicated, twisted structure. And we want to be able to see these kinds of things in great detail. 
We have lots of ways of drawing molecular structures. You guys have all seen the sort of ball stick models. To move, mute your thing. Okay. Keep talking. You go ahead. Um, but you guys have probably all seen conventional ball stick models. We also draw a lot of sort of more conceptual visualizations that show things uh, for the purposes of context, like drawing this surface representation that shows a simulation box that shows the boundaries of the water box that the simulation was being performed in. You done fiddling? Yeah, yeah. And uh, here, yeah, yeah, yeah. You jumped a slide ahead too. And uh, yeah, but that's all right. And so we have all these different representations. We want to combine a bunch of those things together uh, to elucidate important details about how these structures work. We might want to show the waters as little spheres uh, going through an aquaporin channel and, and the active part of this channel that filters, uh, this is something that's in your liver, by the way. This aquaporin channel is what allows your liver to filter your blood and remove all the you know, harmful contaminants. And it works by a tiny little molecular mechanism in this special little spot. And it basically lets water molecules through, but not anything else. It's really fascinating. It's, I think it's about a bathtub or two full of water every day goes through uh, one of these uh, aquaporin channels. Absolutely fascinating. So if you want to make a visualization like this, uh, where you just see the waters that actually cross through that channel, you can imagine that's pretty tricky uh, math involved or a little, little bit of bookkeeping to figure out which waters actually went through the channel, which ones just float, uh, floated around in space. So being able to do that uh, requires a complicated atom selection mechanism and various things. Um, we don't just draw the structure as it is in uh, just, you know, just drawing atoms as spheres or some other simple glyph representation. We also analyze the structure and draw things that are representative at a, at a higher level of abstraction to tell us something more collective about uh, the behavior of the structure or structures and their various physical properties. And so uh, there are a lot of things that we draw that have a lot of number crunching that underlies what's being shown on the screen. And so these are all things that are a little bit of a challenge because the interactivity that we demand for a desktop application is very different from what we need for virtual reality. And so some of these things we can do you know, today, right now, this second in virtual reality, but some of them we will have to uh, make the analysis algorithms uh, maybe 10 or 20 times faster than they've ever been to be able to do that in real time in the same way in a head mounted display. And then there are other things where the uh, calculations take seconds, even on a very fast machine. So we have to come up with ways of how, what's the user experience going to be while something is being calculated. If you're wearing a headset uh, that you don't have much else to do while you're waiting on the computer. So it's much more invasive to your immersive experience. If you go off and calculate a big electrostatic field, it's one thing in a desktop environment uh, you, you know, this proverbial cup of coffee calculation is no big deal. You can quickly go read your email or something like that if you're wearing a head mounted display and you're all set and you're dialed in and you're exactly the way you, you want everything to be. Having that delay or that incursion into your experience is not really very desirable. And so then we can draw uh, things about the, the collective motions of uh, big parts of the structure under dynamics. I don't know if you guys have ever seen, this is a, a very simple computer simulation of a, a little muscle fiber protein. This is done about 15 years ago. And it's kind of nice because it's sort of uh, showing you a zipper-like motion that allows a muscle fiber protein to unfold by a factor of 20. And this helps prevent you from tearing your muscle when you overextend your muscles, things like this. This is a Titan, uh, <clears throat> Titan domain. And it just basically zippers open with a bunch of hydrogen bonds. And you can see that uh, in the visualization we've done here, it's recomputing the secondary structure and various other things every single time step. These are also uh, some of these examples of uh, properties that we want to recompute dynamically, but being able to do that fast enough for a head mounted display is a challenge since it involves the, the graphics. One of the areas where there's a, in my view, a, a great opportunity to apply immersive visualization in VR in particular is in comparing different experimentally determined atomic structures uh, or atomic structure information, different modalities of information superimposed on top of each other. This is actually a very 
visually demanding task. Um, there are ways to do it quant quantitatively, but uh, inevitably we look at these things quite a bit. Uh, so as an example, for the mo majority of the last 40 years, we got atomic detail structures using an experimental technology called X-ray crystallography. This is in involving uh, synchrotron radiation from beam lines shining onto the uh, atomic nuclei and getting an X-ray scattering pattern, and then they can compute the actual atomic positions for everything except for the, the light hydrogen atoms. And uh, that's great, but one problem with this experimental imaging modality is it's rather like taking sardines and packing them into a container. They aren't in their natural form. Or as my boss used to say, uh, it's like when you tell a soccer team to line up for a photograph, that's not the same thing as seeing a soccer game in action, right? So if you want to see the game, the game of life in this case, you don't want to see it when it's been packed into a crystal. You want to see it in its natural uh, sort of in vivo conformation. So there's a complementary imaging technology called electron microscopy, and they basically freeze these structures very nearly to zero uh, Kelvin. <clears throat> and by doing that, the atoms almost stop moving, and they can get uh, very close to atomic detail images uh, from them in their much more native state. Uh, but as you can see, they're much more blurry than these are. And so what we want is we want to take the atomic detail we have from crystal and combine that with the coarse uh, structures, or relatively coarser structures we get from, crystal, uh, from microscopy, <clears throat> and get the best of both uh, modalities together using supercomputers to fit these together. And the inspection of how well they, they match is a big, uh, you know, visually oriented task, and we want to understand where there's agreement and disagreement, and it's something that the scientist wants to spend a lot of their time doing, <clears throat> but to do it very effectively or efficiently. So <clears throat> VMD began actually in its earliest form, it was actually a cave application uh, before I even came to University of Illinois back in 1993. And uh, its original use was to do uh, real-time visualization. Yes, Bill. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, well, I, I would have assumed you would have told them, but yeah, so a cave was a, room-sized virtual reality experience, uh, 10 by 10 by 10 cube that you can basically walk around in and wearing special glasses, you would get the same sort of uh, experience that you have today with a head-mounted display. The goal of the cave, in part, was computers of that time could not draw these scenes a hundred some times a second. So they could not overcome the, the motion sickness problem that we have today with uh, head-mounted displays when you don't have a fast enough rendering uh, loop. So this, the solution to that was to draw the entire space on a multi-wall projector. And instead of having to keep up with the user's head rotation, you actually displayed it on the room around the user. And it didn't matter how fast they whipped their head around, it was always correct. And so that was a very expensive solution to the latency problem of that time. <clears throat> so uh, VMD ran in the cave uh, for many years, and we were able to do things uh, like watch live simulations and things like this. And so getting spammers calling my phone. Um, and, we were, and we were able to watch live simulations and things like this, do interactive steering of uh, simulations as they run on supercomputers, and get uh, immersive visualizations. But the difficulty with a large facility like a cave is they're very expensive. We used supercomputer class hardware at the time to be able to drive the projector systems to make those images. And it's a, you know, a sort of a one person at a time shared use facility that's always in high demand. There aren't very many of these. So the exciting thing that's happened with the commoditization of uh, virtual reality on head mounted displays is now anybody can have one. And not only uh, can you have one, but you can take it with you in your backpack. You can go to a scientific conference or to a poster session. You can uh, pre-render immersive movies and things like this. And you can ha be having a conversation in front of your science poster and hand a headset to your colleague and say, hey, look at this uh, simulation I did. And they have that immersive experience uh, that once upon a time, you know, required a very specialized facility. You can now take it with you in your backpack anywhere you go. 
to me, that's a, a, a mind-boggling change uh, caused by these uh, technologies. But there are still problems to solve. You know, there are, uh, the head-mounted displays make it difficult to collaborate. One of the things we could do in a room-sized VR setup was you could have four or five people standing right next to each other, sort of packed in, and they could look at the same part of the world in the same place and sort of see the same thing and have a natural conversation. And because you see each other standing there, you can have a normal human interaction just like you would always do. When you put on a, a, a today, headset like we have today with the software we have right this moment, that's not the same experience at all. It's very isolating. <laughs> it makes it difficult actually to have a, an interactive conversation unless somebody's gone through great effort to make their software sort of um, collaborative uh, able or something like this. You don't really have a means to allow somebody else to see exactly what you're seeing. So you're either guessing at what they're seeing or you're kind of seeing it uh, by virtue of whatever's showing on a, a secondary display, something like this. But it's really not the same thing as what we had back with these room size things. So we have to work on our, our software, you could say, to regain what we lost <coughs> uh, you know, when we gave up those very expensive room size facilities. So the, the major benefits, you know, if I were to enumerate what, what I think the best uh, values are of virtual reality for structural biology, they basically boil down to a very intuitive navigation through a very complicated, uh, geometrically complex environment. So you can, uh, with a room scale VR system like a HTC Vive, you can walk around in the space. If the molecule is suspended in the air before you, you can uh, very naturally walk around this structure and see all of its different details <coughs> and uh, having uh, the ability to scale that and change the relative scale of the molecule versus your own scale. Uh, you can select things, you can grab things, interact with it. I'll show you a couple of those in a minute. <coughs> um, you can navigate down into very complicated, hard to find crevices in a very big structure. This is the outside of the HIV capsid. And one of the things that happens with HIV is uh, these little pores are permeated by ions and the, you know, the relative ion concentration, these things are important for how stable the capsid is. If you're able to make this capsid either hyperstable so it would never open or uh, unstable so that it cracked open prematurely, you could basically interrupt the viral infection process. So anything you study about how this capsid works or what holds it together or what uh, mechanics in, are involved in its uh, construction or destruction uh, would be an advantage. So being able to position the camera uh, deep in, inside of complicated uh, geometry like this this is, you know, you can do this with a desktop windowing system with a mouse. Uh, an expert user can fly around and get to this point. <clears throat> a non-expert user, though, this could be a very painful process uh, to find a camera view that portrays this very clearly and captures the key geometric details that are important in how this works. With something more sophisticated, like a six degree of freedom input device, like a space navigator or a space mouse, you can do that a little more easily, but with a headset, it's very easy. Headset and two uh, hand controllers makes a, a navigation like this <coughs> completely trivial. So some of the uh, tasks that people need to perform are, as I was saying, uh, comparing different modalities of structure information. And uh, you know, we, we basically want to interact with the structure information primarily uh, using our hands and move by moving our head and walking around in the space around the model. So some of the things that we want out of the sort of the, I'll call them tools, the, the interaction modalities we have in the VR user interface, we want to be able to do for navigation, being able to walk around, teleport, scaling, uh, resetting views, things like this to known positions. We need to be able to do selection. This is a, an area that's really complicated. When we use a desktop application, we can write in plain text a, a key, a bunch of keywords that mean something geometrically or uh, in terms of the molecular structure, just like you would type into Google, right? We can say, uh, show me the protein that's within five angstroms of such and such part of the structure. I can type that very easily. Doing that without a keyboard 
expressing that same thing uh, in a, a virtual reality environment is challenging because I don't have the ability to type. I might be able to say it. If I had a very good voice recognition system, that would be one way out of that problem. <coughs> uh, the alternatives boil down to user inter interfaces that are sort of modal, where you, you'd sort of give it a hint, I'm going to be doing this kind of selection, and then I have to go pick things uh, by hand using the wands, uh, things like this. Some of the other tools we want are <coughs> for manipulating or pulling or selecting things on the molecule, uh, changing the lighting. By moving lights around, uh, you can get a much better understanding of the, the relative uh, spacing and packing of the geometry that's in the scene. Of course, using higher fidelity lighting schemes like ambient occlusion lighting will give us a lot of that too, but that's very difficult to do at the frame rates that are required for head-mounted displays. So there are trade-offs there. <clears throat> and then the last thing are um, sort of interaction tools that allow you to cut away parts of the drawn geometry so you can reveal things that are on the interior. I might have a surface on the outside of an atomic structure that uh, corresponds to one of these cryo-electron density maps. And I want to be able to peel that away and show where the atomic structure is docked on the inside. Do they dock well? Do they dock poorly? Can I cut that open and see how they're fitting? I may want to see several uh, things superimposed on each other and be able to uh, cull one of them away while leaving the others. And so I can use various clipping tools for things like that. And so now I'm going to give you a couple of uh, movies, hopefully, if this works, that will show you some examples. So I, I videotaped a colleague of mine doing this uh, yesterday. So hopefully this works. And do you hear any audio? Yeah, so that, that gives you, that, there we go. <laughs> that gives you an idea sort of what kind of simple interactions you can have. You saw how rapidly he can grab and move the DNA molecule around. Uh, the DNA molecule is just very easy to see. You know, it, it, in reality, we never look at something that tiny or that simple, uh, but it sort of gives you an idea what sort of, what a basic uh, VR interaction mechanism looks like. And then if we look at something that's a little more interesting, like I was describing earlier, where we have 
uh, two structures superimposed on top of each other, then we need to be able to use uh, things like clipping planes and other tools uh, to evaluate their quality of fit. And we'll try this again. I don't know how we get the echo down a little bit, Bill, but we'll try it. Let me mute that one again. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I guess we're having AV tr troubles with the combination of the computer audio and the, the projector. So, um, what Barry's doing is he's showing the cryo EM density map uh, lined and docked with an atomic structure. And he's cycling through a, a variety of different visual representations that allow him to evaluate how that uh, structure is fitting whether there are areas like you can see, there's a, period, a piece right there where the atomic structure is sticking out. So this would be an area where they disagree. So that either that uh, atomic structure has some piece uh, represented that isn't in the density map that he got from the uh, microscopy density map, or that density map, you know, for various reasons, they're noisy, they may have culled that part of the geometry. He's then just uh, moving it around. You can see him pull it closer to his face. Uh, he'll cycle through a few more representations. And the ne next thing he's going to do is he's going to start using a clipping tool. So we have a number of different clipping tools. And he will then slice open the outer structure so you can see its interior and the contained uh, material on the inside. So hopefully we'll get to that in a second here. And so he's reorienting this. I was tricky to record all this without getting decked by the hand controller because I was sitting there with my cell phone and he can't see me. You know, in the, in the cave, that natural interaction I was talking about that doesn't exist with the HMD, you can actually get whacked pretty hard if uh, one of your friends is giving a, a bunch of gesticulations while you're trying to videotape them in the VR headset. So there's the clipping plane. He's slicing the structure, all of it in this case. He's now using a little cube and he can peel away just the outer surface by pushing that cube into the structure. And they, now he'll use a clipping sphere, I believe. And you can see the helical structure of the interior of a, uh, what they call a carbon alpha helix. That's fit inside that density map. And so those are just some of the common uh, tools for interacting with the structure. And I think here we don't get into some of the more fancy lighting and things like that, but uh, you can see I'm using the clipping plane there to chop that open. And he's going to cycle through a couple of, uh, yeah, there you go, to a different representation. So it's interesting, um, you know, head mounted displays present a bunch of technical challenges. It's things that we take for granted, like drawing transparent surfaces. It's easy to draw transparent surfaces, or at least relatively easy if you're not constrained to high frame rates. Uh, to draw them at 150 frames a second is very difficult, and so you end up doing various things that are sort of cheating. And so they don't work as effectively when these cheats are being used. They don't look quite right. And so you're getting the immersion, but you're not getting uh, perfect rendering. And so that's an interesting problem that we uh, run into when we use some of these different uh, VR tools. So what you were watching there uh, was uh, Barry operating the, uh, the VR demos um, that he's shown were basically an Unreal Engine based demo that we constructed by taking the uh, molecular structure scenes out of VMD, importing them into Unreal and combining them with a bunch of the VR tools that we've implemented in Unreal. <coughs> And uh, these are uh, sort of VR oriented variations of the same things that we have in the normal VMD software, but this allows us to play around with those 
interactions and the different tools that we think are useful and try them out uh, in the game engine at very low cost. You know, the difficulty of implementation in the game engine is very low, so you can try a lot of things very easily. <coughs> the things I was talking about, like transparency, one of the things we learned very early on is the game engines are not as capable of dealing with very large scenes. So we, we work in uh, VMD, you know, VMD is designed to draw molecules, game engines are not. And so uh, the, that's one of the major differences between uh, games and things like that and what we do with molecular graphics. We have very geometrically complex scenes, but if you look at what we draw, we draw a lot of uh, simple shaded objects that have, tend to have sort of uniform colors. They don't have textures like carpeting or they're not, you know, they don't have posters, things like this around on the walls. Uh, we don't have flora and fauna to represent as texture maps. That's a very different uh, aspect of what we are, uh, the drawing work that the computer does for molecular graphics versus what we do for computer games. So that's one, one thing that we'll get out of a uh, completely native uh, HMD implementation in VMD is we will get back a lot of the performance that we lose when we put those things in the game engine. So here he's showing uh, handheld light moving the light around so that you can uh, basically light up different parts of uh, interior surfaces. One of the problems you have with molecules is that there's stuff everywhere. When all the things that we study in, in molecular biology are inside the body or inside of uh, animals, human cells or plants, and those spaces are full of, of material, there's no empty space anywhere. And so what that means is if it's kind of like walking in a dark forest all the time. Anywhere you are is full of material and you have to be able to cut it away to be able to see something that you want to look at. So if you imagine a surgeon uh, wanting to look inside of a, the body to look at an organ or something like that, that's what a scientist has to be able to do is to cull away all the stuff that isn't interesting for the particular routine that they're uh, trying to do and they want to see just those things that are of vital interest or that explain the, the part of the structure that they want to study. So some of the things that we, have, we find that are difficult or where I don't really have a good answer for how we will, I don't feel presently I have a good answer for how we would do these things in VR. We have a lot of tasks that are multimodal. They involve uh, looking at the structure while we're looking at something else at the same time. And the something else could be a 2D plot or a clustering analysis or a large tabulated display of some sort of quantitative information. It might be the amino acid residue sequence. It might be any number of other things. And so our solution to those things, you know, in everyday practice has been a, a lot of our scientists have big, large, you know, flat screen TVs. They're like 50 inch TVs that happen to be stereoscopic. And at their desk, they're able to have both the stereoscopic view and they can see all this sort of 2D information at the same time. And that's very effective for those sort of multimodal tasks. If we wanted to do the same thing in a VR headset, we would have to have a sort of a virtual clipboard. You can imagine in, inside, and you've, you guys have probably seen VR user interfaces where people have done that. You have some virtual clipboard. The problem is a lot of the stuff I'm talking about, it isn't uh, five columns of data, it's hundreds of columns, which is why they have a big screen TV on their desk in the first place. So the visual acuity we have with the commodity headsets, you know, the, we have plastic printed lenses that have chromatic aberration. We have very re relatively low resolution displays still for each eye. It's gonna take a few more generations of head mounted display hardware to bring things to the level that it, it would be comfortable to use sort of this virtual clipboard type interface inside of VR to be as effective as what we have today with a an, an old school TV kind of solution. So that's an interesting problem. Another problem we have is that, you know, ultimately uh, connected even to the highest power workstation that money can buy, there's a limit to what is possible for us to render. And so, uh, but scientists don't want to be limited. <laughs> so that's a difficulty. And this is a plot of the size of the structures that the scientists have been studying over the last uh, 20, 30 years. When I joined University of Illinois in 1998, 100,000 atoms was the biggest thing that would run on the largest supercomputer on the planet. 
and now we're doing structures with 100,000 atoms to uh, half a million atom or half a billion atoms. And the next step is to uh, fractional cells or you know proto cells, minimal cells. So one of our collaborators uh, is studying in a wet lab. They want to basically engineer human designed cells. Well, part of the process of that involves cutting down an existing organism to its absolute minimum uh, functioning parts so that you have the bare essence of what it requires to sustain life. And if you were able to come up with that and understand how it works, you could then use that to engineer cells to, uh, for human purposes, whatever they may be. But that's gonna require uh, understanding uh, length scales and time scales that are below what experimental methods can give us. So we'll have to do uh, computer simulations to get there. And so basically working collaboratively with them probably over many, many years, this, this is just the beginning. It will probably take 20, 30 years for these things to take place, but uh, we begin studying things on this scale. Well, right now this takes the largest supercomputer in the US uh, to be able to simulate one of these things and to visualize it in a normal windowing system, you're very happy to get uh, a frame or two per second with a whole bunch of GPUs working together. And the size of the data, you know, just the atomic coordinates and uh, basic information about this structure is about 63 gigabytes. And every time step as that structure moves is another 12 gigabytes per time step. And so this is, uh, you know, terabytes for a very, very short time period of simulation. And that creates a huge challenge for bringing that in. How do you get something like that into a VR uh, HMD? And so there are a lot of different um, sort of technological approaches that will assist us with that. But ultimately, we're going to have to do visualizations of that scale on the same computer where the simulations are being performed. So how do we attach a, an HMD to something like this, right? So, um, the, the supercomputers have tremendous uh, power by virtue of uh, tightly coupled GPUs and CPUs with very high bandwidth memory buses that allow them to communicate very fast. So uh, the Summit machine at Oak Ridge, every node has six Tesla V100 uh, GPUs, which are you know each faster than any uh, video game oriented GPU you'll ever see. They have a die stacked memory that's on the wafer where the, the arithmetic units are. We can do the same kind of OpenGL rendering that you would do on a normal GPU on a desktop machine using something called EGL with a little change to a person's software. You can basically do all the same rendering we would ever do uh, on a desktop. We can do it in a sort of headless mode on the supercomputer, getting exactly the same outputs just changing you know, how we do our OpenGL from a windowed type of mode that uses a windowing system to using EGL, which is more like what a cell phone uses. <clears throat> and we can use GPUs now to do things like ray tracing. And the value of ray tracing in the context of molecular graphics is we can go from very simple lighting models, which are, have been used for eons in OpenGL, but which are not very helpful. <laughs> to lighting models like this uh, with, on the right, ambient occlusion, where we can see all the uh, pockets, pores, and depressions, and different structural details immediately. Yes? This is the same three shapes. The only thing that's different here is how they're being lit. And so, you know, one solution that's cheap and sleazy, right, is we let the user have a light in their hand, and if they can wave it around, your mind can kind of integrate the, if you wave your light, your flashlight around, you get the impression of this, right? But it'd be a lot better if it just looked like this from the get go, <laughs> right? So this is very easy to do with advanced rendering techniques like ray tracing. You, you can also approximate this with OpenGL, but it's tricky and it's very tricky to do it fast enough that you can draw it in real time in a head mounted display. But that's, you know, this is what we really want. So we want the realism and the uh, visual fidelity that we get from te uh, rendering techniques like ray tracing, but we want it in virtual reality. So how do we do that? Well, for regular visualization, we can use uh, all these bleeding edge GPUs that we have today by virtue of uh, YouTube and cat videos. 
they all have hardware accelerated encode decode for uh, compressed video. So they can do H.264 and H.265 in the GPU. Even the ones that are in the supercomputers, every GPU out there has this now, right now. <clears throat> and so uh, you can basically render images on the supercomputer, compress them into a video stream and send them over the wire. Now uh, that will work great for a windowed laptop, but how do you exploit that for something like a head mounted display? I can't do that at 150 frames a second. So there's got to be a trick. Well, there is a trick. So the trick is rather than generating the exact view of the instantaneous head pose of the head mounted display, we can use a trick more like the cave where we draw the entire world in all directions and we send omnidirectional video back to the head mounted display and then the user's head can rotate and be redrawing the scene 150 times a second, uh, but it's already got the image for that part of the scene. So it isn't so important to have 150 hertz update rate when you're just moving in a, if you're just walking in a straight line, but it's really important to have it for when the user whips their head around or, or just looks around in a natural way. So we can, we can uh, then exploit this uh, to not only uh, cover the latency and, and allow us to do remote visualization, but we can use this omnidirectional projection so that we can then use a larger number of uh, GPUs and CPUs to render the scene. Scenes that would be much too difficult for a, a single workstation to ever be able to render in real time. We can engage a large amount of hardware to render this uh, very complicated scene in, with higher fidelity rendering techniques and then we are able to maintain a uh, very high frame rate. And so the, the internals of VMD basically, aside from all the OpenGL based rendering, there are uh, GPU accelerated ray tracing engines implemented inside. And then <coughs> uh, in, a, in the first implementation we did, NVIDIA uh, formerly had a product called a video computing appliance or video computing appliance, whatever it was, VCA. And it was basically a box that had eight GPUs in it. And they built these into clusters that were directly connected with InfiniBand cards. So you could have as many of these as you wanted. And the idea was they would sell these to uh, Pixar and the movie studios and so on. And that would allow them to do real time preview of uh, sort of film quality visual effects uh, without having to wait for an overnight batch mode run. And they could see it as it should be. So we did a prototype of this idea using uh, these VCA boxes. And so this allowed us basically this VMD would send geometry to a, a, this VCA cluster. The VCA cluster would uh, render and accumulate the image and then stream the video back to VMD in, in a very simplified diagram there. Here's a more complete representation. So if you imagine the remote rendering cluster is in this box somewhere across the internet, in, in our case it was in California, VMD was running in Illinois, uh, communicating back and forth with this rendering cluster, sending it uh, commands to update uh, geometry and so on. And when VMD got the video back, it then sent it to a, another little piece of code that just ran in a very high frame rate loop, uh, taking this omnidirectional image and projecting it for the current head pose of an HMD. And so by doing this uh, very, very fast, you, you can get uh, a real-time HMD image. So to do this, how, do, how does that work? We have to render two omnidirectional images, one for the left eye, one for the right eye. There are several different omnidirectional projections in existence today. The two that are most widely supported in GPU hardware are what they call a cube map. So that's literally like the cave was, a, a cube. Uh, on which each face of the cube uh, contains a 90 degree uh, field of view uh, in that direction. And so these are the six faces of one of the cubes for the left eye and six faces of the cube for the right eye. The other one is uh, <coughs> an omnidirectional equirectangular projection. So the upper half is the left eye and the bottom half is the right eye. And they are kind of like if you peeled the skin off of a globe, right? So if you peeled the, a globe out and made it a rectangle, this entire top line is basically the North Pole. 
but it, and when it's on the globe, that collapses to a single dot, right? But when we have it as a rectangle, it's sort of peeled open like this. There are some advantages and disadvantages to these different formats. These uh, are easy to handle and work with, and, they're, and in fact, this format is what YouTube uses for omnidirectional stereoscopic movies. So if you've ever played uh, YouTube VR movies, that's how they're encoded. And so, uh, in fact, we originally implemented the rendering uh, code for this in VMD for the purposes of rendering movies for YouTube uh, for, for the uh, small portable phone-based uh, VR headsets. <clears throat> but after we did that, that sort of uh, made me realize that we could also use it for this purpose also. <clears throat> the disadvantage to these is they over, you know, you can see a lot, a lot of pixels did sort of duplicate work along this upper edge because really that's just this one point at the apex of the globe. I could have represented that more efficiently with a lot fewer pixels. <clears throat> and so the cube map would be a better choice as far as efficiency, but for whatever reason, a lot more software tools, at least at the present time, work with this kind of image format. Um, you can convert between them. I think my understanding is YouTube has invented yet a newer <coughs> omnidirectional image format that is a pyramidal scheme. So it's sort of a cross between these kinds of schemes. And uh, there will probably be more of them as time goes on. And the benefit of the more efficient uh, omnidirectional image format would just be that you don't need as many uh, megabits per second of network bandwidth to transmit it over the wire for the same amount of quality. For today's headsets, this is not a big deal, but if we start having VR headsets that have 4K uh, resolution per eye, then you could imagine that the, the bandwidth savings would start to become very important. So to make these sort of omnidirectional projections, if we just had a normal camera, you, you can make an omnidirectional image by sort of imagine a, a camera sort of turning around in a circle, you get a normal image, right? To make a stereo image, we have to have an offset to the left for the left eye and to the right for the right eye. And so you'd have it sort of, if this is the center, now I have to walk around the center in a circle like this and I make an offset image like this. <coughs> uh, for every pixel, we have to compute these directions separately. So this is an interesting detail. This can be done very easily in a ray tracer. It is very difficult, or, or I would say right now it's impractical to do this with rasterization. So there's not really a good way to do this with OpenGL. So uh, this is one thing that lends itself to being implemented in a ray tracer. We can compute these ray directions completely independently and arbitrarily in a ray tracer. In OpenGL, they can't be done so easily. <coughs> uh, so that makes it uh, sort of, at, at least at this moment, sort of a ray tracing only uh, scheme. But that's generally true of panoramic, uh, of, uh, panoramic projections in general. Uh, they're very easy to implement in ray tracers compared to rasterization. Uh, by doing things with a ray tracer, another advantage we get, we can have effects like depth of field. We can have a focal distance, so we can focus on certain parts of the scene. If, you know, this is an interesting thing when we're flying around <coughs> inside of this uh, satellite tobacco mosaic virus, we can see the RNA structures and we can see various ions floating around. If you have something like depth of field, it's a very natural effect. If something gets too close for you to, uh, too close to you to be able to focus on it, then your tendency will be to ignore it, especially if, if you have a proper depth of field, you can have things such that by the time they get uncomfortable for you to look at, they kind of uh, fizzle out and they go away. So that's an interesting thing that we get out of uh, advanced rendering techniques. Uh, you can also have things that fade as they get close to, too close to the camera for the user's comfort. All of those things are a problem with HMDs because we have a fixed optical apparatus in the current generation of head-mounted displays. They don't allow you to change your point of focus. So by doing these things in the rendering uh, that we do, we can avoid those things becoming uncomfortable for the user. This is an omnidirectional projection on the interior of an HIV capsid. So you can see this, this is one of these equirectangular <coughs> projections. And the user is actually, to get the idea of what they're really doing, you have to stand almost right in front of the screen. 
the user's head is really right here. And so if you look to the side or around you, you see that's, that's why the rest of it looks so small is because they're really close to this and they're far away from the rest of the scene. And so doing this uh, now two and a half years ago on uh, two or three generations old GPU hardware, but, but admittedly powerful clusters of GPUs, <clears throat> using one, one machine with eight GPUs, we were able to get frame rates in the <clears throat> between 15 to 20 frames per second in terms of the streamed omnidirectional images. So the HMD is rendering at uh, 150 frames a second, but the update says the user is flying through the world or only about 20 frames a second. So that was what we were able to do then. Um, the new ray tracing engine that's in VMD today is able to do the same thing now on a modern single GPU on a conventional desktop machine. In fact, the, uh, the latest RTX <coughs> NVIDIA GPUs that have hardware accelerated ray tracing for the first time, one of those GPUs is faster than almost 30 of the old ones. So it's, it's a huge change in the performance. So this is going to make things, ray tracing is particularly well suited for some of the uh, special projections and things that we want for uh, virtual reality and for omnidirectional projections, it's uh, ideally suited. And so it's gonna make a lot of these things very easy. Um, so this is, uh, specially modified op Oculus headset. You know, some of the other things we did were uh, replace the standard low cost pressed plastic lenses that were in the early Oculus headsets. Um, there was a tool that a group of researchers at Microsoft made that uh, would basically compute by brute force. Looking through an optics catalog, you could specify an optics formula and it would go find off the shelf lenses that would meet that optics formula for the least price. And so I, I used the results of their tool and we were able to basically 3D print a replacement lens ocular and using uh, lenses bought commercially from Edmund Scientific, we could replace the stock lenses with uh, lenses that are basically perfect as far as chromatic aberration and other things, sort of showing what we would get if they decide to make more of a professional quality headset at some point. As of yet, even though it's been uh, almost four years since I did this, none of the shipping commodity headsets are even close to as good as those lenses are yet. Now the lenses cost as much as the headset did. So to be fair, that was $300 of lenses for a $300 headset, but for science, that's probably a good trade-off. You know, if you're gonna work with this in a serious way for your uh, livelihood, for something you really care about, uh, then that's not expensive at all. I would gladly spend that, I'd spend that in a heartbeat, right? So I am very anxious for them to make progress on that dimension of the headsets because then we can start working on, it'll be worth it to solve the problem of bringing large tabulated data into the headset. If I can actually read the ta you know, these tables and numbers and things like this, then there, there's a reason to go through that UI design trouble. So, so we basically uh, figured out how to do the lens distortion corrections for both the stock and the improved lenses and how to make all that work. And, you know, that's, it's an interesting experience to have done all that. I'd highly recommend anybody to uh, try these things for themselves. And so these are the original <coughs> uh, ray traced images in their original form before they get sort of uh, distortion uh, corrected for each of the lenses and the stock and, and modified headsets. So, and those are all built into VMD presently. So we have lots of new things to do. The performance that we're gonna get out of the new RTX ray tracing acceleration is probably the most exciting thing for me personally. One of the other hot areas right now that's really interesting is the use of AI to remove noise from images. That's another thing that'll make it possible to use ray tracing for very large scenes that may not have been practical in the past and to do things like image warping. So this is another, you know, another thing you can do besides just put more horsepower into rendering is to, do, to use approximations. I have seen some amazing work by other people where they have taken a series of multi-view stereoscopic images and they feed them into an AI algorithm and for real-time VR, they can synthesize in between views for positions that they had no projection for. 
completely through an AI algorithm without actually doing any re-rendering at all. <clears throat> and so that's really an area where there's a tremendous opportunity for future work. Um, and then, you know, as you heard, a lot of the work that I will have to do for my application boils down to solving <clears throat> complicated user interface problems and uh, particularly coming to grips with how we are going to do collaborative interfaces or how to make collaboration much more natural uh, like it used to be in things like the cave. And so with that, I'll take any of your questions. Yeah. So the question was, have you been able to model Brownian motion? So with the, um, there are a variety of simulation tools that our software interacts with, and there are uh, quite a few Brownian dynamic simulation packages out there. Um, uh, we have a group in our lab that develops a tool called ARBD, which is Atomic Resolution Brownian Dynamics. That's one such tool that we work with. Uh, but there are a bunch of other tools um, that you can get uh, that are open source that we uh, support now. Yeah. Other questions? Alan has a couple from our engineers. Alan asked about user fatigue on head-down display versus the cable. Yeah, so Alan had a question about user fatigue in the head-mounted display versus the cave. You know, that's a difficult question to ask. I would say uh, the difficult, you know, uh, part of the reason I find it hard to answer that question is it's been, for me, uh, about 12 years since we had a, a normal full-fledged cave in daily operation. And so I, and there's been no overlap, you know, and the, the issues and the work that was being done aren't even the same. So I don't have a, a control with which I could evaluate that. But I would say that they're similar. You know, my recollection was that I would never see anybody use the cave for more than about an hour and a half or two hours. They would get tired of it and the glasses, the old glasses we had in the cave would end up cutting into your nose and being very uncomfortable. The ergonomics of, of the headsets we have now are a hundred times better than they ever were. Um, my recollection is that was a limiting factor. I have seen people use the new headsets for far longer periods of time, uh, but one complaint they have about the new headsets is they get warm because you, you know the, the light, the display panels generate heat. And so some people find that that makes their face start to sweat and it becomes uncomfortable for those reasons. So, you know, I, I don't know that I have a good answer, but it seems to me that the ergonomics of the modern uh, headsets are as good or better than the LCD shutter glasses ever were. They're probably heavier, but they fit the head more naturally. They have their down, you know, their downsides, but I've seen people that are motivated use them for a long time. So I think we're at least break even. We chose Unreal, yeah. So I we did the work on the Unreal Engine with our colleagues at NVIDIA. So with those a joint project. Uh, with one of our colleagues, Case, and uh, Case Van Kooten is an expert uh, software engineer at NVIDIA, and they have a lot of technology invested with the Unreal Engine. And so we knew that uh, working with them, we would be able to exploit some of their best uh, work uh, performance-wise on uh, Unreal. And I think I have a slide I didn't show in here, which uh, is sort of on that. So we did a demo with them at Supercomputing 2016, and we showed one of our atomic structures in there. That's Bill, actually, I think, uh, standing in front of the demo. And so our colleague, Case Van Kooten, uh, worked with us to get these things into Unreal, and the, the motivation was purely one of performance. The, the structure we were showing is called a chromatophore, and it's, uh, the part of the structure we showed was 10 million atoms, and it was right up against the wall as far as the performance being able to be uh, judder free and uh, not inducing motion sickness. And so, you know, basically on, on the basis of their expertise with all those different gaming engines, the Unreal Engine was the favored uh, choice at the time. But, you know, we ourselves don't have any particular um, 
reason to favor one tool or the other until performance or some other factor becomes an issue. I know that uh, Unity is very popular and I've worked with a number of people on molecular graphics uh, VR projects that did use Unity and it worked perfectly fine for those, but they were much simpler uh, scenarios than what we were doing here. So uh, does that answer the question? Yeah. That was from Unreal, yes. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Same. Yeah. So, okay. So the, the question was differentiating the conventional uh, OpenGL based rasterization approach, you know, desktop machine, direct driving, a head mounted display and showing the user interactions like I did in the videos in the first half of the talk. Uh, what's the difference between that as opposed to what I talked about in the second half, which was really oriented towards addressing super large scale problems that can't possibly fit on the same, you know, the normal desktop machine. How is the user interaction, you know, uh, the same or different? So the difference there is the 100% of the code on the, the second half of the talk uh, is all mine, which means that all of my efforts in the initial part of that work were on the rendering infrastructure and the interactions were relatively simple. So they were things like, uh, just, you know, mostly navigational flying around. I had a basically a game pad controller that would allow me to fly around. At the time that we did that work originally, the Vive didn't support Linux. All the supercomputers and all the desktop workstations that we use in our science work are all Linux machines. And, yeah, the Vive was, the Vive was, as you know, was NDA behind closed doors. And so we had all seen it, but you had to, you know, sign away your firstborn child. And so, um, to get any of this to work on Linux, we had to do all of it ourselves. So basically just because of time constraints, we wanted to demonstrate the viability of these things first and go from there. And so one of the things that's happened since then, like I said, is the, the evolution of the NVIDIA's hardware products and so on and other things means that a lot more of what we had done in that first implementation is now our code, whereas uh, the original implementation, at least half of the, like all the video streaming was in NVIDIA's code, now it's my code. And so I've had to absorb a lot more of that responsibility to make that work. Um, so it's nowhere near, we don't have nice uh, hand-like, uh, you know, glove representations or any of that stuff in the Linux version of this code. The Unreal Engine, basically, uh, yeah, Case Van Kooten at NVIDIA had already done all that so we could exploit what he, he had already implemented and generalized and use that in the, in the uh, material you saw. So, but that sort of the idea was we're attacking two different parts of the problem. Use the game engine and a rapid prototyping environment to evaluate the experience and what you want to be able to do but then the other end of it is how do we attack the size problems that, you know, the, the one we showed here is still the limit. Like right now, even with the latest generation of GPUs, we are just now happy with the frame rates we get with this uh, state-of-the-art hardware, either with Titan Vs or with uh, RTX 2080 Ti's, we get the frame rates we want, that we wish we had back in 2016. Uh, now we have them, but that's only 10 million atoms. We're now dealing with structures that are, you know, 10 times to 20 times to 100 times that many. So how do we make those work? And that's what the other work was focused on. So they're just, you know, they're sort of both a snapshot of those projects at a particular state in time. But the guy, uh, ideal would be sort of a continuum where we can do both because we need to be able to do both. You, not everybody runs on supercomputers and, uh, or wants to. And, uh, you know, if, if you have something small, like the majority of the VMD user community aren't even all hardcore researchers. A lot of them are people that take classes. They download a protein structure from the protein data bank for a class. They want to look at those things. Those people don't need a supercomputer. They could uh, just do it the tr traditional way. So we actually have to have kind of both modalities to work. So if I can ask yeah. Dave, this might be part of what Dave was asking. As far as you've got 20 frames a second mm -hmm. updating, but you have the 
faster, but with that 20 frames a second updated, how does that affect the user? I think what, what I would say is what it affects is uh, when you're, oh, sorry. So he, Bill's uh, uh, fine tuning of the question is how does that affect the experience? Well, my feeling of it, you know, so far is the, the one thing you do notice is with 20 frames a second affecting things like navigation. So if you're moving around, you definitely feel the rate of updates for translation, right? But when you move your head, it feels uh, completely smooth. So you notice that there's a difference between head rotation and translation or when you move the object toward yourself, there is a difference. Um, the limitation at the time was, you know, as I said, we we're doing this cross country, 20 frames a second from California to Illinois was as good as we were gonna get. What's interesting now is we can do the same thing that we used to do remotely, we can do with a single GPU now in one box. And so th those numbers will, you know, go far higher than they were. Um, I don't know what the limit is, and that's an interesting thing. So a number of things have changed. We have H.265 now, whereas the old implementation was only H.264, so it takes half the bits now to do the same thing that we did before. Uh, we have higher resolution headsets though, so perhaps that gets, you know, they're sort of break even. Uh, but that's all I would say. I didn't, I didn't personally find it uncomfortable. I don't know, uh, Bill, what would you say? So one of the things you didn't show is that of course you did the ray tracing and then it would fill in the details once you, once you moved. You oh yeah, yeah. I forgot, that's a detail I forgot to mention. Another thing that you can do with things like uh, ray tracing is you can have what they call progressive refinement rendering. So you begin, if you're flying rapidly, if you're really cruising along, uh, the, ray, the ray tracer gives you a rapid rendering of the world's surroundings. And, but when you stop, it actually uh, shoots a large num much larger number of samples, maybe 20, 30 times as many. And so if, you're, if you hold still, it looks gorgeous and perfect in a way. Yeah, yeah, you can still look around your head as long as you don't translate. But as soon as you uh, move your, your location to a new spot or you move the geometry around you, it has to re-perform re all those calculations. And so that's an, uh, an interesting thing that doesn't exist with OpenGL. OpenGL just draws what it draws and that's all there is. It's, you know, it produces whatever it produces in the, in the single pass. There's no subsequent improvement or anything like that. So that's something that we have also is, uh, you know, if you know about uh, how video compression works, it exploits the fact that humans have a weakness Un under high motion you have very low visual fidelity. Like you can get away with uh, compressing a tennis match tremendously. That flying tennis ball, they can get away with representing that tennis ball almost with a square and you wouldn't even notice. I used to work in video compression. So, uh, and, and by exploiting some of those things, we don't have to render uh, scenes under high motion with the same fidelity either. So that's another uh, dimension of scaling that's open to us if we use sampling based approaches like ray tracing rather than uh, you know rasterization schemes. There's one more question from the Zoom audience and that is any experience with Unity Mall? George, this is George from Purdue, he's found that uh, both Unity and Unreal struggle to render large proteins unless they build their own rendering plan. So you can repeat that at some point. So the question was if I had any experience with Unity Mall and both Unity and Unreal have uh, difficulty uh, rendering large proteins unless they've built their own rendering code. And the answer is yes, of course. That's, that's sort of what, that's what I, I agree exactly with what he said. That's what I was saying about halfway through the talk is that it's not just a matter of VR, it's, it's just the nature of things. If you try to get Blender to render a molecule, it's a disaster there too, or Maya, or any of these tools that were not meant to draw molecules, uh, we have so much, so much uh, geometric complexity, a lot of uh, conventional rendering engines are just not well suited to the task. And so that's, uh, I don't blame them because they are a general purpose rendering engine or rendering framework and to do molecules well requires a lot of effort, but that's why I have a job, so I don't mind so much. I, I would say though, I, I haven't played with Unity Mall much, but that criticism I think is just generally true of almost all of the tools that are not completely purpose built, built tools. <coughs> Other?
Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Now in that second half where you showed, you know, the old work, the old work, how does the, the way you render your image, how does the way you pre render your image mm -hmm. attack the, the appearance of parallax? Is it you know, that slight? It, it looks exactly the same as it does. In fact, the, the perception you have, although it got rendered as this omnidirectional image, you can't tell the difference when you're looking at a certain degree field of view. It is the same image that you would have get, uh, gotten had you rendered just a rectilinear uh, image of that part of the space. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, but, but as far as the way the image looks, it looks the same. Yeah, you can't, if you, in fact, one of the tests I did was I rendered the view as seen in the HMD by rendering it directly to the HMD in a normal cam perspective camera, as opposed to rendering it omnidirectionally and then doing all the warping and da 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 and then and reprojecting the omnidirectional image and then subtracting the two images and see how much they differ and they're basically insignificantly different. So it's, if you do it properly, it should work out exactly the same. There, you know, one of the things that is different, and I'll, this is an interesting thing about omnidirectional images. So what if you wanted to, this is an area where there's opportunities for future work, let's say, is with an omnidirectional projection, an OpenGL, let's say I wanted to draw something over the front of, uh, like, you know, like in a game, like let's say with the, there was a cockpit or I wanted to draw, superimpose something here, a menu or whatever, right? One in interesting problem you might have is how do I compose an omnidirectional image drawn with a known depth and various physical properties with something that might be locally rendered by the playback or the, the receiving machine that is a different GUI. I can encode Z buffers uh, or Z depth information into the omnidirectional image, which would work fine, except for one thing. There is no such thing as a Z depth in an H.265 video stream. Hmm. So I might have to then resort to encoding two video streams, one for the image uh, with the color data and one for, I don't know, other stuff, whether that's Z buffers or other things that we want so that we can compose both a remote rendered omnidirectional image with a locally rendered uh, menu or glyph or clipboard or whatever it is, you know. So that's an interesting thing is, you know, the, the, to make that work as flexibly as what we would have with a normal OpenGL pipeline, we need some of the same thing. So I would need a Z buffer and I'd need to transmit that and compress it and decompress it also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm a user, I mm -hmm. use this is the first that I've really seen any of this sort of stuff. So how far along is it for me for me? I want to get this up to my lab and the front side. Is that the plan to actually get it for the one side of it or for the lab that you can use? Is it at the point where you can download PDB files and you can actually do this right away as a user or does it require you so the, I would say, uh, yeah, so the repeating question was uh, basically what is the state of maturity of the existing solutions for an end user? And I would say right now we're in very early days. This is the Wild West. And I'll, I'll blame it on a couple of things. And, and it isn't really, it isn't the fault of anything in our field. The biggest problem we have right now is there is a lack of standardization among VR hardware and software. And so right now today, if you want an application like VMD to support an Oculus headset, they have to write code for Oculus for Windows. If they want that same uh, application to support the HTC Vive, they have to write their code again for the Vive, also for Windows. If they want it to work on Linux, they have to write it for OpenHMD or some other uh, you know, emulator or uh, reverse engineering effort that tries to bring these things to work on Linux. There is a Kronos group effort to standardize the programming interfaces among VR platforms that is not finished yet called OpenXR that Bill and I have been dying waiting for. 
And once that happens, it will make, you know, the problem is scientific software is done on a shoestring budget. And so we don't have the developers to re, you know, we can't just go write 10 versions of the code for no particular reason. And, you know, now there's another, now we have the Windows, uh, what do they call the inside out tracking that Microsoft does. That's, so the Windows mixed reality is yet another incompatible interface. So once all those things get unified, the way that OpenGL unified the graphics part, you know, now we can actually write one piece of code and it should in theory work with all the different headsets. That's gonna cause an explosion in the availability of tools. I didn't really get into that, but that's actually the other reason why we did a lot more work in Unreal Engine than we did uh, writing it from scratch ourselves, because we knew everything I've done here that was done myself was done with OpenHMD on Linux because I had to, um, I didn't have a choice. And, but I also know that all that code, all the stuff that related to OpenHMD or the minutia that had to do with the, that particular headset would all have to be thrown away. So I wanted to minimize how much time and energy went into that. Whereas the stuff like the game engines, they have legions of programmers that are paid for by the profits of their video games and they run across all the platforms. So what I would tell you right now is, What's available right now are things that sit on top of existing game engines like Unity and Unreal, and those are your best bet because you won't get any, you're not gonna get any traditional scientific tools being ported until this cross-platform portability issue gets resolved. Until that's resolved, the, there isn't enough research funding to get these things ported, and so it just isn't gonna happen. If somebody's you know, really motivated and, and willing, they might port it to one, but they certainly aren't gonna support all of them. So that's what we're all waiting with bated breath for. Um, I don't know if you so wanna say anything about free that. Apps on Steam, they can load up molecules yeah. I don't know, tens of thousands of atoms yeah. or so, right? Uh, and we can show you after the talk is over, yeah. actually, if you wanna see that. Um, so yeah. some of that stuff, it's not, it's, of course, it's, it's not as sophisticated as yeah. the ideas, but it's, it's out there. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. I know of at least five or ten such small-scale things that are floating around that run on the game engines, but they're not, you know, they're not a full-fledged tool. They're not a finished uh, thing. They, they're really for just for looking. They don't uh, edit structures. They don't do any analysis. They don't contain any of the science code, per se, uh, other than just looking at the atomic structures. So they're very basic. Uh, but, you know, once we get past the portability limitations and we're not dealing with all the difficulties on the rendering side completely on our own, in principle, you're going to start seeing quite a few other programs. Like, I, aside from DMD, I know that the UCSF Chimera, they have a version that uh, at least supported one, one variety of headset. Uh, I would be surprised if there isn't an adaptation of PyMall to at least one of some kind. I would be shocked, right? So they, they're all in an early stage, but nobody is willing to do a bunch of redundant work that then has to be thrown away. So that's, that's what's limiting us on the serious software side of things. Any other questions? All right, thank you, John. Yeah. If anyone, there's probably, I think there's a couple of people saying I'm like, there's a sign-in sheet here on, my, on the desk there with a the laptop. If you can go through that afterwards, you can find that. Thanks everyone for coming. And then uh, I know a lot of you are were interested specifically in John's talk because we're talking about molecules and rendering. Uh, but we, this series is ongoing on the floor next week and the week after. Um, and next in two weeks, we'll be talking about virtual tours. Sure. Uh, yeah, John, say, oh, I should say one more thing before, oh, sorry. Uh, we also realize that there's a there's conflicting talk for those of you right now. Is it time to probably we'll probably have to schedule John to come back again to talk at the chemistry building uh, in the next month or so. Given John whatever uh, John's schedule permitting. Yeah. Yeah. Completely arbitrary, but kind of related. Sure. When I was a kid, I saw this movie called Star Wars. Uh -huh. just well, we just and they were playing chess, and there were these little monsters. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought then, holograms are eventually going to be really common. Yeah, how are you? And I don't see them. So, why? So, uh,
a holographic uh, display. Was that all made up and fake, or no. was there something? No, there's just... so holography is a real thing. And back in 1977, they could do a still picture, is what they could really do. Uh, and it was done with, uh, you know, back in those days, you had to be a physicist to have to hear it, right? But they did holograms, and you could hear them, but they weren't the moving thing. It wasn't like television. It would be like looking at a. It looked like what so they didn't look like, but they, they weren't moving around. Right. Did you want to try so what they have now? They actually do have holographic moving displays now that are extremely primitive. They're maybe half as good as what was shown in Star Wars, right. but they cost two million dollars. You know? And they went like something that's a giant physics experiment, and it's not anywhere near a okay. production rate to pay. Uh, but there are people working on that stuff, and as I understand it, the limiting factor to making those viable is actually imagine the number crunching that goes into normal yeah. computer graphics. We do now use right here, so. uh, a GPU is a computing device that has the same horsepower as a uh, you know a top flight supercomputer from just ten years ago. You know one GPU that has. Uh, 15 uh, teraflops, right? Okay. So that, that used to be a room full of computing power, right? Just 10 years ago. And that's what it uh, takes to render the things you see on these video games right now. To do holography requires something on the order of uh, 50 times that much. And so that's the issue that prevents it from, from becoming a mainstream thing at this point. So, you know, they will have to get more computing horsepower into GPUs. It is a volumetric rendering, not just a 2D picture like it is now where we have pixels. They have so do you see this boxes. happening in your lifetime? Yeah. yeah. Doing yeah. this yeah. stuff, but you're I've sitting here right demos. here. I have seen oh, demos. Yeah, well, that's for I have seen demos at SIGGRAPH where they have done, uh, you know, holographic display prototypes, you know, under controlled conditions where they, they have these things working. Yeah. yeah, pretty cool stuff. This is great stuff you're doing. Thanks. Thank you for yeah. coming to talk to us. Sure. What's the, what's the difference between Steam and then this Unity stuff? So Steam Unity is the, is the there's a, Valve is one of the game development companies, and they have a standard ecosystem to package games so that you can put all the app store for games. That's how okay. I describe it. Okay. That's what it really is. For the, for that, it's, an, yeah, it's, an app, it's an app store, right? <laughs> but it also is, it, it provides a wrapper that makes the same game work on different hardware sort of automatically. Okay. So games developed for Steam uh -huh. will work on Linux and gotcha. Windows gotcha. and Mac. Uh -huh. Whereas normal games that are developed outside of that ecosystem, they could, but it's a function of the development effort of the original uh, software engineers, not uh, there's nothing helping them do it. Gotcha. So Steam provides those software engineers with some automatic cross-platform uh, handling. Gotcha, gotcha. So that's, you know, that's one thing that's appealing about the Vive is it is uh, under the Steam platform, but yet still on, on Linux, it's not quite there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I didn't. You know, I didn't want to say anything too depressing in answer to your question, but I didn't want to lead you on. No, 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 no. I'd no, rather no. you hear the real, honest truth. The real honest truth is, right now we, you know, it's like the bad old days of the 1990s, where every printer used to have a driver for every sure, program sure, sure. you would use it with. Yeah. That's the way VR is now. I hate now, to say. Now, thankfully, you can't you know, find a CD true. drive anywhere. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, but you, you remember having to get, oh, I need yeah. a printer driver for yeah. my word processor. Oh, yeah. I need another driver for my my spreadsheet program. Yeah, yeah. And then finally they unified all that right. and life got better. Right, right, right. We're, right now we're in that era with VR where it's a complete mess, uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. They have to deal with this. But, you know, getting the, the stakeholders in a room, mm -hmm. you know, you can imagine what these meetings are like. They they want to standardize things, but each one wants to maintain their what they sure, perceive what they, to be their competitive advantage. Yeah, and it's yeah. a death match as far as they're all concerned. Yeah, yeah. So if their enemy gets a leg up on them, it's the end of the world. Right? Yeah, right, right. So it's hard to make forward progress under those conditions. Right, right. What we need and, and don't have yet is a benevolent dictator to make them cooperate. <laughs>
I, uh... We had that with OpenGL uh, because SGI invented and, and patented OpenGL, so everybody had to go along with whatever SGI said. I see. Uh -huh. And so that worked for a long time, uh -huh. and it got OpenGL over the hump, right? Okay. And then when SGI sort of ceased to exist, OpenGL lived beyond SGI's existence. Uh -huh. um, but it was a hard road for them. <laughs> and uh, oh, so here you go. Yeah. So if you want to put these on, yeah, yeah, totally. There's a tutorial that comes with it, but I don't know. Let me see if I can mute us here. Oh yeah, there we go. Oh, Reach your arm in front of you towards the camera. So there's some Velcro. I don't see anything. Yeah. 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 So these, all these things here, if you're blocking those with your hand, that prevents oh. the track. Oh, I see. So also, <laughs> so, if, so if you turn around and my hand hands off, yeah, yeah. and also if you turn around because the the tracking technology is behind you. Is it working out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking about playing So there was a tutorial going on. It may have instructions on the side. I'm trying to grab it, but it doesn't want me to grab it. All right, so look on your left hand. Does it say something? Restart. Restart challenge. Oh, so it's trying. Exits it's, like a, it's like a little. Yeah, uh, I, 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 a uh, game tutorial, I guess. Maybe exit to, maybe point from one hand, point at that, and press exit to lobby and see if it, or reset challenge maybe one of the two. Yeah, there you go. Oh, this is crazy. <laughs> well, you shouldn't have to, just start tutorial. Press the point and start, there you go. And now it should teach you how to use it. Your home for nanoscale design. Here at the NanoScale, you can design anything you want from the very atoms which make up the world around us. This structure is known as insulin. It is the key component to regulating your blood sugar levels. So there's two grip buttons. Way down here. No, down below. Down like in here, right in here. No, not, not where your thumb's on. Oh, sorry. Uh, is it frozen? There we go. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's, it it's not the, there's down here, literally on the side, to do this. it's called the grip. Yeah, I think they push both of those at the same time, you can like stretch it. There you go. Oh, this is crazy. If you bring your hands together, hold them directly, you can scale it down. Once you find a good size for your molecule, release the grip buttons. The major issue I have is no, it's very intuitive, like he says. I mean, it's incredibly intuitive. Right. Yeah. With VR. Yeah, that's what we've been kind of hoping for. Those of us have been doing VR for a long time, is that we can get to this point. Yeah. And you can also leave it still, and you can walk around it to see different areas of it as well. Well, we'll try to walk out of your way. I know there's a hammer there before. So. Yeah, I can move that.